My journey, my personal journey, started in Tasmania. And Tasmania is, is a beautiful state of Australia. It, it's surrounded by nature. It's a place where we really are proud. We started the green movement in Tasmania. And it was actually, ironically, to stop dams, stop hydro dams, because we, we had enough dams. We, we had beautiful rivers we wanted to protect. But out of that became a, came a spirit in, in the state. And moving through my education and university, I went to university in Tasmania, we started to learn about what could be. We had some inspiring people teaching us. We learned about the wonders of the molecules. We learned about the wonders of energy. We learned about the wonders of hydrogen. I took that with me and I've taken it throughout my life. The vision that was painted by a small group of lecturers and, and, and teachers that embarked the idea, the concept of what hydrogen could be. So what is the hype about hydrogen? It's the most abundant element in the universe. It, it's odourless, it's colourless, it's ubiquitous. It's in our water, it's in, it's in the rocks, it's in the, the fossil fuels. It's a key element. There's something about hydrogen that we, that we so often forget. We use it already throughout society. We, we create our chemicals out of it. It's part of hydrocarbons. You know. but, but there's some fundamentals that we can really start to use. So hydrogen is, as its molecular form, which is actually not the most common form, but as a molecular form, it's an energy carrier. It's like a battery. It's its own battery. And that's the key. What can we start to use that for? So a bit of an engineering nerd. Uh, engineering PowerPoints uh, go hand in hand these days. So uh, pardon if these are some complicated bit, but look, I think it's important just to have a little bit of a feel for the science, the science behind this, because it's right down to the fundamental science. One of the wonderful things about hydrogen is that that energy carrier piece, but that allows us to really unlock some unique features. New Zealand's got wonderful renewable energy. We're 85% renewable electricity, and that's, that's an important piece. But there's a lot of times that wind's blowing and it's 2 o'clock in the morning, or the dams are spilling because we've had a, a wet season. What hydrogen can let you do is capture that excess energy and make that available for use at a later time. So that's an important concept. So how do you do that from renewable energy? We use what's called electrolysis. You may remember back in classrooms, you, you put cathodes and anodes in beakers and turned on current and bubbles started coming up. And that was hydrogen and oxygen came up. But you can capture that hydrogen is the key. You can capture that. That's now energy. And you can start to use that in all sorts of applications. You can use that to um, store and use later. You can use that to put it into a car and, and put it into fuel cells or trucks. I'll talk about that a bit later. You can actually use it to power industry. You can use it to provide the feedstock for industry. It's important to understand we're using already hydrogen all the time, but we're getting it from different means. We can also use it, though, to capture that excess energy we talk about and the renewable energy. We can actually bundle that, and there are countries in the world that don't have the renewable capacity of New Zealand, that can't just go and generate, go and put up wind turbines, can't put solar up, can't build dams or use hydro. So we've got a unique opportunity here to capture that energy. And we can sell that across the world, and we can bring renewable energy to the world, much like Saudi Arabia's brought oil to the world. So some unique things we can do. One of the things I really like, and pardon my, my poor animation, but this, this concept of a fuel cell is pretty exciting. So you effectively reverse the process where your hydrogen molecules and your oxygen molecules come together, and as they come together and bond and form water, an electric current's generated. So effectively, that energy that you've stored in the hydrogen molecule can be turned back into electricity. And we can use that to power our vehicles. We can use that to power our ships. We can use that for all sorts of applications. So the obvious question is, if this is so wonderful and it's been around since the Big Bang, why aren't we running on this already? Now, I'd like to look at it through the concept of, of, of a hype cycle. Now, the Gartner hype cycle is, a, is an important concept that's used in IT a lot to describe the cycle. Gartner is a, a, a management consultancy firm, and they describe the cycle of technologies. So a good example might be touchscreens. 
So touchscreen technology actually came along in the 90s, and then there were some early PDAs, and the, if you remember, you might remember the Newton. And it was like, this is amazing, this touchscreen, but it didn't really have the applications, it didn't really have the use. It never really lived up to its expectations. So it got hyped and just, well, it was a bit ho-hum. But then along came the smartphones, then along came the tablets, and it hit the touchscreen technology is at the core of what we're doing with this, this technology. So it went through this rebirth, if you like, and it's built and built and built, and now it's become ubiquitous technology. So think of it like that. Now, with, when we talk through with hydrogen, it actually started primarily in the modern times of fuel cells and so on. It started with a space race. It started with a need to have energy and be able to recycle energy, use the hydrogen they had in the fuel rockets and create electricity, use the solar energy coming from the panels on the spacecraft and use that energy and store it. So this is a fuel cell that was on, a fuel cell that was on the uh, Apollo missions and it's been ubiquitous in all the space station and the, in the space stations that have gone up there, the, the craft that have gone to the moon. So it really had a good start like many things in the space race. Like someone then tried to commercialise. So General Motors built the Electro van in 1965. And it, it was a van that they just filled up with fuel cells and, and containers of hydrogen and oxygen and, and off they went. Now, it went 200 kilometres in range. It went 100 kilometres an hour. You couldn't put anything in the back. You, know, you, couldn't, you probably didn't want to crash into anything at the time. So clearly it was a technology before its time. But then along came a bit of a change in thinking. Up till then, it was all about the oil crisis, all about our, how we're going to run our cars with running out of oil. Then there was a shift in thinking, as we know. Along came the Kyoto Protocol. It's more than just the fuel. It's about how we use the fuel and what happens with that, the, the outcomes from that fuel. So the Kyoto Protocol actually kicked in a new way of thinking. And out of that came some exciting work. Companies formed. Fuel cell technology started its its commercialisation pathway. And companies such as Ballard, Hydrogenics, Canadian companies really got after this. And that culminated in a bus running people around Whistler for the, for the uh, Olympic Games, when they had the Olympic Games there. Now, the challenge was, though, so this was great. It demonstrated that this technology can be used. It was going long ranges. It could take people from Vancouver. It would shuttle people around. It could go the ranges. But it suffered for some things. It was high cost. It was high cost. The, the infrastructure we needed to provide things was very expensive to build. If we think about the challenges we face there, it's a bit of a chicken and egg. So we want to get after this technology. But in order to make it, I need the vehicles, for example, and I need a supply. I need to be able to connect the two, and all this is going to be difficult. So there were challenges there. And then along came a bit of a shift. Along came a some amazing technology where people started to put the lithium battery into vehicles. And they said, oh, we've found the silver bullet. It's lithium. Let's put battery vehicles in and then we've solved it. Well, that's great. It's been brilliant. And it's changed the way we've looked at travel and changed the way we've looked at vehicles. But it's not going to get us all the way there. We need, we need more. And so what happened, though, was the investment actually dried up a little bit. And so the hype, if you like, the, the concept of the hype of hydrogen died right off, and hydrogen entered its trough of disillusionment. But interestingly, the research kept going. Those companies that have started, they're still here. They've started to grow. And what, what caused that? They were driven. The re you know, science, you can't keep science down. You can't keep engineers and scientists from thinking of those ideas and striving. And the funding has been in those universities, and it's been progressing, progressing, and the private companies stayed there. And that's been the key. Because then what happened? The world started to see Kyoto's great. That's a yes, we need to do something. Paris Agreement, COP21's about what's that going to be and the real realisation of the scale of what we've got ahead of us if we are going to address the climate challenges. So what that has done has got commitments from companies, countries. And so the developments have started to change. So what's, there's investments are coming. Germany is investing billions of dollars into hydrogen. Japan is moving to a hydrogen society. Korea is changing 26,000 compressed natural gas buses to 
the hydrogen fuel cell buses over the next few years. There's true commitment. That, the concept that we will overcome the cost. We will, as a society, overcome the cost. That's not an excuse. We can start to create this vision. So it started with the fuel cell forklifts. There's 50,000 fuel cell forklifts running around now. There's 20, one company is building 20,000 a year. It's in the Walmarts and the Amazons all the way through the US. People are realising this is a wonderful thing. I can fill up in three minutes. I can be zero emissions and I can keep my workforce busy. Maybe the workforce wanted a bit more of a break, but they can be kept busy. <laughs> but then the, the car companies who had started early days, they've started to push out some exciting production vehicles. The vehicles here, such as the Nexo, it's, it can go up to 600, 800 kilometres on a five-minute fill. It's zero emission and you can carry your gear in the back of the car. It's, it's nice and light. So a big area, though, for hydrogen, is there's some big benefits of hydrogen, I should point out. So hydrogen, when you use it in fuel cell, it's very quick to refill. So you can refill in five minutes, as I said. It's also very light. So if you want it to go a range, a long range, you don't have to carry, for example, batteries. You, you can carry a much lighter payload, which brings your payload, your commercial payload back. And that becomes vital when it comes to trucks. So if you think of trucking, freighting, time is money and payload is money. So one of the barriers to, to getting electrification of our vehicles has been it's difficult to get the battery electric solution working for commercial and industrial applications where time is money and payload is money. So what we're able to do with fuel cell technology is really ride on the coattails of the battery technology and the electric drives that are coming out. And we can put these fuel cells in these vehicles. So the, the, the picture here is, is of a, um, a Nikola truck. This is exciting. This, this truck, it's claimed, will go 1,500 to 2,000 kilometres on a 10 to 15 minute fill. Zero emissions. It will go higher average speeds because it's got good torque of electric. Not, it's not going to go over the speed limit, but higher average speeds. It's safer because it's got the regenerative braking that electric drive brings. And it looks like it may even be lighter than a diesel truck. So we'll be able to increase payloads and reduce vehicles on the road. But next has been trains. So this train's uh, running in Germany. It's uh, operational and starting to carry passengers. This is regional rail that's zero emission. They've not had to build the catenary power lines out, which are about a million dollars per kilometre to do. They're able to run zero emission transport through all their, something like 60% of Europeans' railways aren't electrified still. And you're able to take zero emission to that part of the rail system. Next comes ferries and marine. So the weight, we talked about the weight. So you're able to, with, with fuel cells, you can get the power and the electricity to go to a zero emission, but you can carry more loads. You can refill quick. So ferries that have got high speed, want to use energy quickly, but then you need to fill them up quickly to go and carry the next load of passengers. So there's some amazing work. This ferry is in, in San Francisco. It's just been, been, the build's been commissioned. And there's a project, uh, there's projects over in Norway, in Europe, and even we've been looking here in New Zealand at whether or not there's some, some work we could do to have zero emission ferries operating in the country. So finally, that's very much about the transport side, but one of the things that's really exciting about hydrogen is we can start to use it for so many other applications. I mentioned industrial feedstock. So this plant in the picture here, it's in Iceland, and it is taking hydrogen generated from geothermal, it's taking carbon dioxide, it's combining those and making methanol. So if you think about that, what we're able to do with hydrogen, it's a key building block for all the chemicals we use. We can start to make our chemicals. At the moment, we get our chemicals extracted from fossil fuels, and then we refine them. But we can start to build that. We can start to grab CO2 out of the atmosphere. We can combine it with hydrogen we make from renewable energy, and we can start to build our, our methane. We can start to build our, our, our jet fuels. It's going to be very hard to, to electrify planes. But if we can make that jet fuel carbon neutral, then we, we've solved that issue and we can use those planes. You think of big, big uh, ships. We, if we can make that methanol carbon neutral, we can run ships on methanol. We can run ships on, on, on liquid fuels. We've made 
and we've got a carbon neutral world. At the key of that is this amazing molecule that's hydrogen. So we've learnt about it. It's been a challenge. It's gone through its cycles. Really what's happened at the moment, we've started to, the world has started to see this is an important, it's the fundamental element, number one on the periodic table. This is an element we're going to need. We can use it to run our transport. We can use it to capture our renewable energy. It will enable renewal, new, renewable energy. It provides a, a, an, an amazing new economic, it changes the economic threshold for renewable energy. We can use it to make our chemicals and products that society needs. But I think that's more than anything. We can really use this to take on that challenge that the world has finally realised we've got to get after. The leaders all around the world, the leaders in our country, the leaders in this room, I challenge you, we take on this technology and it is going to be a big part to play in building the future that we want for our children.